Atlantic salmon are, are an endangered species. They're limited to just a few rivers in Maine currently. We believe that there's potential to recover them uh, more broadly than just those watersheds. So part of our efforts uh, encompass a lot of different elements, but it is a hatchery dependent program. And part of what our approach is to, we call it fix the rivers, fix the fish. So the hatchery element of recovery is, is a, uh, a limiting factor in, in what's possible with, uh, with the recovery programs overall. So <clears throat> where we are located, the, the dam removal you see taking place there is that's the Route 1 bridge in East Machias, Maine. So you go just uh, 25 miles further and you're in Canada at Campobello. And <clears throat> so we're about five hours, five, six hours north of Boston. And these are, it's a wild landscape and we want to keep it that way. The reason we have the Atlantic salmon remaining is largely as a result of the history of the region and that being, uh, yes, there were dams. Um, they were um, inefficient dams in, in that they didn't block all the fish, all the water didn't go through the mills. There were some fishways required. And over time, um, we were able to maintain these species. So our program, as you see here, our DSF approach, so-called, is comprehensive. And because of where we're located um, in the small population, we've become kind of a one-stop shop for um, sea run fish restoration, conservation, community engagement, um, science, uh, citizen science, and really focused on action toward um, doing everything we can for these sea run species. There are 12 sea run species native to New England. We have still all 12 of them in these watersheds. So we're very, very fortunate, very unusual, robust smelt populations, um, sea run brook trout, as many of you know. And um, there is some sturgeon and so on still in the in the system. So we've taken a comprehensive approach, which means that we we also operate a land trust. So we've actually purchased dams, held them during the time which we're then looking toward um, removing them. So it's um, I won't go into all the various programs. I'm going to focus on the science-based stocking effort, which is a critical component of of the restoration. Now I've, I have the window here. I'm going to try to move something so I can see my own slides a little better. Um, so we've had a breakthrough and, and this breakthrough is um, based upon the success again on the Tyne River in England, which is in the very northeasternmost uh, part of England, right in Northumberland, uh, near Newcastle, and a very industrialized river that lost its salmon back in the 50s, almost entirely, not completely. And then over time, um, through a number of um, elements of conservation, had restored a, a fishable population there. And it's one of the biggest success stories in Atlantic salmon recovery in, in world history. So rather than invent something ourselves, we we were fortunate to have been introduced to Peter Gray, who, who created this particular type of conservation hatchery that you'll see. Um, we've had now 10 plus years under our belt testing this. I think I came to GBTU over 10 years ago when we were beginning this to talk about the project. And GBTU has been supporting us pretty um, very consistently year after year to help us uh, make this possible. A lot of what we've done almost entirely up until very recently has been done with private philanthropy. And um, as you see from the numbers here, the return rates of course are what we're looking for ultimately, but we have a lot of measures along the way of what we're, what we're doing to track the, the overall positive you know, impacts of this. So. I'll talk more about how this compares to other stocking methods and how this is different and why we believe it's working. So you see here up to 14 times the rate of fish returning from the, the ocean. 
I'm going to talk a little bit just um, about the Atlantic salmon here and its complex life cycle. Um, the Atlantic salmon is is uh, requires very high water quality in its well all of its um, locations that it migrates through and it spawns, and then uh, it, its rearing habitat in the streams and and all the way out to then Greenland where the young fish migrate um, after typically two and a half years in the, in the rivers, they would then migrate. Uh, it looks like somebody may be in the waiting room. There we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so these, these fish do migrate all the way to uh, West Greenland where they mature. And if, you, if you've paid attention to the salmon um, story over the years, people will often say, well, we're never going to get salmon back until we address the commercial fishing at sea and the issues at sea. And then you go to, and talk with the people in Greenland and they say, well, we're never going to get Atlantic salmon back until we deal with all of the dams and the productivity of the rivers. So it is a complex situation and and the issues in Greenland have been addressed largely. So there's very limited um, fishing of the adults there now. Um, and meanwhile, um, even up till just this morning, there were two legislative hearings here in Maine today that had massive bearing upon the future of Atlantic salmon recovery in the United States. And then just earlier this evening, I was in a meeting in which there was a, a major coalition forming around a fight over preventing net pen aquaculture in Maine waters right, right off the shore of where we're located here. So it's a very, very hot issue and it brings together a lot of um, elements of the economy and so on. If any of you have seen two quite famous films about um, fish and rivers and dams. Um, you may be familiar with the Patagonia Productions, one called Damnation, which if you haven't seen it, you, it's a must, must see about the issues around dams and fish, um, ecology and, and public safety. And then they followed that up with another film called Artificial. And Artificial was a campaign piece by Patagonia to, to look at the issues of uh, net pen aquaculture, but unfortunately they made my opinion a mistake by conflating that with the issues of, of hatcheries and in the wild um, management of fish. So there's two very complex issues embedded in this one film and a, and a fallout result of that has been that um, people have anglers who were the target of, of the film largely um, have gotten further confused around the, the roles of hatcheries in conservation and, and restoration. And like I, I said just a moment ago, we're talking about fixing the fish and fixing the river at the same time. So what Peter Gray was, was applying himself to over this long career he had was toward fixing that the fish, so-called. So fixing the hatchery to produce fish that would survive once released. And coincident with that, we've had tremendous progress with genetics, conservation genetics. So when you put these pieces together, the, the role of so-called conservation hatcheries in um, restoration hatcheries is very different than a put and take hatchery where you know, adult fish are released for the, the fly or the, the hook and, and you expect them all to be killed. So we're trying to restore endangered species using the tool of the hatchery. So why do we have a picture of Peter Gray with chickens in his hands? Um, Peter was a, um, um, he had some hobbies, one of which was raising fancy fowl. And I, I like to say Peter applied the same skills across the broad spectrum of, of um, cultivation of creatures. And in one case with the chickens, he applied the full on domestication version of, of how we intervene in, and change animals. The other end of the spectrum, he worked 
with the hatchery wild fish to do the complete opposite, to keep them as wild as possible. However, the measures of success are somewhat similar in that what he was looking for with the chickens were perfect feathers. What we we're looking for with our, our wild fish are perfect fins. In, in, and a fish that is, as he called, a little athlete. So the story begins with this fellow on the left, Ori Vigpasen from Iceland, who is a, um, uh, a vodka producer. He sold a lot of vodka to Russia, made a lot of money, and then he contributed uh, a lot of his time, effort, and resources toward salmon conservation. He discovered Peter and the story of the time got together with the Grassy Creek Foundation, who you see below there, who it was um, started by a hedge fund manager, an American who was in England, who also saw the tremendous success on the Tyne and helped to fund um, both of them to come to uh, North America to locate an organization to work with, to try to export this technique. Oh, so here's, this is a, a video of the Tyne River. It's a, a river that was formally declared nearly dead. It's an industrialized river. This is not a wilderness river setting at all. And what you're looking at are, are salmon in Ceron uh, Browns, native Ceron Browns, in downtown Newcastle. This will just run a moment more. And that was sent by one of our contacts over there on the Tyne. Um, okay. I'm going to see if I can shoot by that. There. Um, and that just says so much, of course, about what happened in that location and and i've been fortunate enough to have gone over and, and met with the hatchery folks there the scientists as well as the anglers and it's a it's just an amazing um sight to see angling clubs popping up on a on a river that was essentially declared dead many many years back and the feeling, of course, is if they can do it there, we should be able to do it here in one of the very most limiting um, components of this is what do you do when you take the dam out? Where do you get your salmon? How do you produce them? And, and um, assure that the recovery begins through the process, the jump start that a hatchery can provide in our major goal is to get out of the hatchery business. We want out as fast as we possibly can, take our hands off these fish, let them do their business the way that they were meant to do. However, we're in the unfortunate, unfortunate position that we have to intervene. So this is um, the last ditch effort in which we would ever want to find ourselves. And thinking about other species, you can, you can imagine that we don't want to go there with with other things either. However, we're seeing that that this is being done now with corals and and other creatures and in other settings. So genetics is everything. Um, keeping the domestication effects um, away from the fish, keeping them out of the hatchery as much as possible, keeping them in the wild um, and allowing for evolution to, to have bearing on their the outcomes. Of course, we have to assess everything we're doing. We're looking for constant support for this work because we know that the state and federal government have, have largely failed to date to end in the NGOs to recover Atlantic salmon. So this is a, a new project and, and we're approaching it in a, you know, with a, um, with the hope that we can re-inspire people who have become very cynical. We've got, we call this co-management and, and co-management is really um, 
a term being used in fisheries more and more so where where we think about the NGOs, the communities playing a major role with philanthropy and um, the eyes and ears on the ground that, that citizens and anglers and others can bring. So, and the flexibility that an, that an NGO, non-governmental organization has in, in doing things that the, the agencies can't themselves do. So, and here in front of you is a picture of exactly that. So the dam that had been there on the East Machias River had been abandoned for many years. Excuse me, and DSF took it upon ourselves to begin to build a coalition to remove it. It wasn't a complete impediment to, to fish migration, thankfully. And in fact, the reason it wasn't was because it was actually sabotaged by anglers in the late 70s. Um, when it was left abandoned, they, uh, some anglers, uh, perhaps they were founders of DSF, I won't, I won't uh, disclose that at the moment, but some of them um, went in and jacked open those gates that you see there in the middle of the night. Many years later, Bangor Hydro abandoned their uh, powerhouse building that had a a diesel fired uh, power plant in it. And that's the building you see here. And they offered it to the state. The state didn't want it. Uh, we ended up taking it. It was abandoned, full of pigeons and, and just a mess. And over time, we changed it. So we, we removed the dam. Uh, we had a, uh, just before 9-11 um, occurred, before the military was all sent elsewhere. They were still looking for training exercises and we were able to bring them um, military in as under a training program to remove this dam. Now you see the dam back in the 30s and you see the fishway over on the far right, but this, there's a couple of things missing, missing of course, water and fish. So this river went through a gauntlet like so many other rivers did, but Again, it never entirely lost its native population of Atlantic salmon, miraculously. So that's that same building now. Um, some irony here that we're now powering a lot of it with uh, solar. We had a main PUC grant to do that. So we've been very creative about the different sources of funding that we brought into this. Some that have little to no direct bearing on fish or Atlantic salmon, but community development funding and so on. So here's the hatchery. And again, just to, to back up one little bit, these salmon are of native origin strain. They are, they are derived from spawnings that happen at the federal hatchery. Uh, the oldest salmon hatchery in, in North America is, <clears throat> excuse me, the Craigbrook National Fish Hatchery in, in Maine here. And they retrofitted that hatchery at the time of the listings um, into essentially six different hatcheries so that they could hold the six separate strains of Atlantic salmon um, separate because they were known to have been river specific genetic strains. So parallel to what we're doing in our hatchery, in the federal hatchery, they're maintaining the genetics of these fish and watching them very closely to make sure there aren't aquaculture genes from escaped aquaculture fish there and that they're not breeding um, siblings and, and those types of things. So the major difference here that, that we're testing and, and now we have full uh, agency buy-in on is the use of this life stage, the so-called PAR life stage. So this fish, um, is the top one is the size that we're stocking them out into the river. And that fish is about eight months old and its parents were in a hatchery. They were derived from fish that were taken from the river and they're spawned. They deliver the eyed eggs to us and we place them in this unusual contraption over here, the wooden box that you see with the water coming out into the black tanks. And that's an incubator. So rather than these being in a system where the hatchery manager has uh, determination over when they get put into the big tanks, the fish tell us themselves. So they're, they're in river water. So 
one major element of this is that they're they're in the river in which they evolved over thousands of years. So the water that they're being incubated in at the point that we receive them as eggs is river water. It's unfiltered river water. It's it's not heated, it's not cooled, it's the real deal. And and then they're placed into these incubators as if they were in the bottom of the river and we don't touch them. We don't see them for a month and a half. And, and initially they're in, in a, a nest of trays and then they get, um, as they, when they first hatch, they're put into these, they, they go down into those interstitial spaces that are inside there like gravel and they're covered as if they were in the bottom of the river and then we wait and we wait for them to swim out into the tanks and then we begin to feed them at that point so it's we believe a, a crucial part in the in their um, development in a couple of different ways one of which is as you see them here in the incubation box the elven um, they use they have all this energy stored in their yolk sac and if they're kept in a tray a screen tray like most like all of the hatcheries use in Maine, they all pile into one corner, they swim and swim and swim, and they wanna be at the bottom of the pile. And they wanna be out of the light and in the corner, like they're up against uh, the gravel and so on. And they use a lot of energy. And as a result, when they come out, they're, um, they're much smaller than in this system, because here they're resting away from each other. The other piece of this is that they're swimming out on their time frame, and it's like a bell curve. They, they swim out into the tank when it's right for them. And even though they're, they're all related um, distantly or very close, um, they come out on, on different time frames. And we believe that the brain development that's associated with initial feeding and, and this whole emergence timing is perhaps very important in their future success and, and wildness. And, um, and that could take the form as Peter Gray would, um, was fond of saying, you know, these fish can go anorexic if they're not fed on the right time. So rather than having the hatchery manager inter look at the big tray of fish and say, okay, it looks like they're ready to start taking feed, time to dump, 15,000 fish all at once into the into the tank. Well, some of them will be, you could think of them as preemies and some are late bloomers. Um, and if they're not getting fed right at the right time, you could lose and begin to domesticate, essentially have domestication effects on the population by losing all those, those early um, hatchers. And they could be the successful fish ultimately, so we don't know. The tanks themselves, you notice a black with a white ring in the center and with very accelerated water flow. So Peter talked about ath the athletic nature of these fish. Ultimately, they need to be able to make it out there in the wilds. And, and we don't want couch potatoes. We, you know, they've got to be able to, to hack it when we release them. And and part of the benefit of having them in completely um, native water, un, unpurified um, water, is that they're getting some insects in through the pipe. Not a lot, but there's some coming in through. And of course, they're getting turbidity and acidity changes and all those types of things. And the white ring in the center is to allow the hatchery managers to, to see what's going on to some degree. So the accelerated water flow, the black tanks, the incubator, these are all departures from the standard um, systems that you would typically see. So over time, in this river and other rivers, various approaches have been tested for stocking methods. And while we've accelerated our work in in um, addressing the issues at sea, say with the Greenland fishery, or we've accelerated the issues in watershed management to deal with prep clear cutting or dams and fishways and other things. The hatchery wheel of, of the, the trike 
has been moving slower than than all the rest in two ways. One, in um, adaptation and change to this more rewild hatchery, and also in terms of overall production. So we are making rivers faster than we are filling them with fish. We're making salmon rivers because of the culvert and dam removals and so on. We are make, literally make, remaking rivers and we have a lot, a lot of vac vacant habitat and the hatchery capacity in, in Maine and in many places is, is poorly lacking. And then the, the, the de design of the hatcheries is also shown to be lacking. So this is just to show you over time what's, what's happened with different types of stocking in this very river and typically in other rivers in Maine and elsewhere. Um, this is the watershed. It's um, Machias is, uh, is a small town in Washington County. It, this is just to the east of Machias. And what we've been doing is testing um, stocking densities and and um, and then over time watching uh, the response in the population. So there's a big question about how many is enough if we're going to restock these rivers. Um, are we even um, has the baseline that we're we're shooting for moved over time, and we just aren't even approaching it, knowing that these are schooling fish; they need to go out in mass in order to be protected from predation and so on. So we've we've been playing with um, the stocking densities per so-called unit of habitat. Um, our assessment, again, we've had uh, in certain years, uh, really extraordinary return rates, which really caught the attention of a lot of the uh, salmon biologists. And um, in order to understand what's going on at various points in the life cycle, we've done a number of different um, assessments. One of which is electrofishing. You're all no doubt familiar with this. Excuse me. Um, and what we're looking at is not annual variation so much as so-called decadal means or medians. So as you can see from this graph here, over we've we've really boosted the overall population. So this is number of par. These are par that have have survived for at least one year after we've stocked them, um, sometimes uh, more. And what we're seeing is that the population is is much more um, similar to a wild population where we have some three-year-olds and which is almost unheard of with other forms of stocking. And, and we're uh, quite sure that these older fish are, are going to be more likely to survive at sea. So you see the results here. Um, at, at the left, you see our smolt traps. So these devices are, the cone is is pointing downstream and there's an open aperture at the front end. The fish are migrating down on their way to the ocean and away to Greenland as smolts after two and a half to sometimes three and a half years in the rivers. And we capture them. And because we've marked uh, for 10 years, we've marked every single fish that we put out with an adipose clip. Um, we're able to discern those fish from from others that are in the system. Uh, wild reproduced fish and, and the small amount of um, young, uh, young of the year or fry that we've put in a couple of tiny tributaries. So the, the number has gone up. It's kind of plateaued now at that, at the point that you see, which is, is a pretty good spot and much um, better than the other stocking methods. So we're, we're our target is to be producing um, one smolt per unit of habitat, and we're just hovering just below that. And then in the fall, we go out and we, uh, this is the most, probably the most coarse um, element of what we do, and that is um, looking for adult salmon nest in the bottom of the river. And that is um, very imperfect science. And 
So knowing how many adults are returning is, is a big question mark. But since we're doing this the same way across many rivers and, and over time, it gives us a pretty good handle on what's going on. And the, and the red counts have been sometimes excellent and sometimes above average throughout the, the time or always above average, but sometimes really quite excellent, like in this year that's noted here. two sea winters so you see two sw returns per 10,000 smolts so the bar the um the colors here represent four different rivers being stocked in four different ways and the top one here is the east machias and the very least uh, return rates that we see are the lowest the blue and that's the penobscot river the one that most people hear about um, they're stocking what is called an accelerated par there. I'm sorry, an accelerated smolt. So they're bypassing two years of in-stream um, uh, growth and, and, and natural life history in the Federal Green Lake National Fish Hatchery. And for the purposes of efficiency in the hatchery, uh, largely accelerating the smolts to to go to sea in, in one year so that they can produce 600,000 smolts in a year, put them in this river. And then what you see here is a, you know, a very poor return rate. So again, this, uh, the Narraguegas, the Sheepscot, the East Machias and the, and the Penobscot are what you're looking at here. And the other rivers have combinations of, of fry and, and some par and some smolts and some fry, in whereas the East Machias is, is almost entirely par. So with that, um, 10 years of data that you've seen sort of synthesized here, the agencies at, who were uh, initially very reluctant to allow this even to proceed um, have now fully adopted this this method and that's oh, sorry um, represented in this this table there's a lot of words here that you probably can't read but you see these five downeast so-called downeast rivers and the downeast shrew uh, de shrew salmon habitat recovery unit so what you're looking at here all these numbers represent units of habitat units of habitat and each column is in in a width class so to the right is the very largest uh, main stem river habitats. So you see there's a lot of, of part, there's a lot of um, juvenile salmon habitat there as compared to way over on the left, the A width class, less than six meters um, wide. Um, and what's recommended as a result of our work is that all these B, C and D width classes get stocked with with so-called zero plus par, they're not quite a year old, so less than one. Um, whereas in the very smallest tributaries, the unfed fry can um, can work fairly well. It works about as well as the par stocking. Yet it it allows for those fish to have that much more time in the stream. In what we're what we're seeing coming out of our research, which is done in combination with the state and federal agencies is that we have a new prescription if if you will for uh, each of these rivers if we had the capacity if we had the facilities this is the formula that would give us the best success based on over a decade of of research that we've done so we would stock a small number of fry and certain tributaries but the bulk of everything else would be done with par so as a result of that, we received a, uh, our first uh, grant from the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for this project. They've been a partner and they've been contributing in in, uh, in kind services and equipment and genetics and management, of the, but to act for actually the production of the fish as par from our facilities. Uh, we received this matching challenge grant, which GVTU and, and others have been con contributing toward 
and last year was our first year out of out of the gate um, and uh, between our pledges and and in hand you know funds some of which we spent to to run our production last year and assessments um, we're we're looking at over a five-year period now we're one year in uh, the, the next four years is raising the equivalent in order to un, um, unleash this seven hundred and fifty plus thousand dollars from from U.S. Fish to run this project and to run it in now two rivers so that we have um, a comparison. This is not the other river. I, I will. Um, our goal and and the project as it stands currently is for our East Machias facility, which you saw the photo of, to produce fish for the Narraguegas River, which is to the west in near the town of Cherryfield, and to continue the East Machias. So we have kind of a paired study going, um, and we're, we're looking at the efficiency of the numbers per unit of habitat stocked and the size of our facility. So we've said, okay, we can do this in two rivers, um, given the funds and our anticipated uh, fundraising, you know, goals being met, but we're going one step further. And this is, uh, you're hearing this, um, not many people have heard this yet, but what we would like to do and, and need to do, because we know that there are other rivers that need this treatment is to take this facility, which is again, an, another former powerhouse on a dam that we removed in the town of Columbia Falls on the Pleasant River, which sits between the East Machias and the Narraguegas, and to retrofit this in this way, um, such that we have 10 of these tanks in an expanded building. So we would come off um, the left side of the photo here with an expansion of this facility. That's the head of tide in Columbia Falls, so our discharge would be <clears throat> again into tide water, which is very helpful in terms of permitting, so that we could then stock perhaps the Denny's River in the Pleasant or the Machias in the Pleasant and, and begin to replicate this over and over. I will quit my screen and take questions if I can figure out how to do that. Stop share. I think you got it. Dwayne, that was that was really, really interesting. Uh, learned a lot about what you're doing and it's really kind of novel. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel. You you borrowed it from the folks in England, right? That's right. They came and, and handed it to us, essentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's proven technology. Um, so a couple of questions in here and, and, and uh, Jeff, feel, to, feel free to chime in. Uh, Janice had a question. How do you calculate the, the return um, in Janice right. Field? Yeah, yeah, it's um, <clears throat> fair, fairly simple, but it's it's becoming more a little more complex. So because we don't have a trap on this river for adults, all we can do is to go and look for evidence of their presence through the uh, location of their reds, so their mm -hmm. nests. Mm -hmm. So you saw the the guy standing in the canoe going down river. So we go down river in the fall after they've spawned. And, and we look for those nests and because they're such a big fish, they stir up a lot of the bottom. The bottom of the rocks hasn't, doesn't have algae on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so when they flip those over, you can see those nests, not it's like I say, imperfect. And we have high, high tannin rivers. So, and then we have of course, flood events and those types of things. So it's, it's pretty coarse, but we know where to look. And, and sometimes we look by foot um, and we do that a number of times during the spawning time and we, you know, geo-reference them with GPS. And so we're not double counting and, and that kind of thing. So pretty manual process, a lot of volunteer yeah. hours. Huh? Right. Well, that, that is, that's a really good point because it, it's a, it's a perfect opportunity for volunteers to get involved. However, it's cold <laughs> and wet and da dangerous. On the other yeah. hand, if you like deer hunting, it happens to con coincide with deer season. So a few deer have been shot during those those surveys and uh, that doesn't hurt to have a canoe with you when that happens. So yeah, yeah. Uh, we, but, uh, and 
a piece of this is that in order to know what the return rate is in comparison to the, the um, uh, immigration rate. So we have numbers of smolts leaving the system and we measure, and then we have a rough idea of the number of adults returning from that cohort of fish that went to sea. And then we see on other rivers in the state, like the Penobscot, where there are traps in the river, and they have a pretty good handle on how many smolts are going to sea. We can look at the ratio. What's mm -hmm. the success rate of these compared to, to others? So there's a couple of other traps in the state. The Narraguegas happens to have a trap on it currently at a dam that's under scrutiny for potential removal. But while that trap is there, it gives, that's why we chose the Narraguegas, is now we'll be able to see those fish coming into that trap. However, in high flows, fish do jump that dam. So it's, again, it's imperfect. Right, right. Uh, I had a question when you were talking about the different strains, but I think you answered it. You, you custom uh, hatchery if you raise each strain for each river so that they're, they're um, linked to it. And I think Chris had a related question. Do you think, do you, do, do you have anything you do to imprint the stock fish to their new natal waters they return? And I'm going to guess other than the river water that you're feeding, that your hatchery has to be on that river or near it, right? Right. But uh, Atlantic salmon tend to imprint, but perhaps not wholly or as well. It only, um, or most prim primarily when they smultify. So they go through this metamorphosis from being a freshwater fish to a saltwater fish. And at that point in time, they really queue in on that river. That's why you can raise 600,000 in the Green Lake hatchery in one river, bring them to the another river, put them in the Penobscot, and then they will imprint at that point. Now, the imprinting might be inferior to if they were raised the way that we're raising them. So it most undoubtedly is. So, so that by virtue of them being in that river at the time of uh, that metamorphosis, they, they are then imprinted. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Jared had a question on what time of year do you do the stocking? Yeah, it's the fall. So these are called fall par um, <clears throat> or zero plus. So, <clears throat> excuse me, they haven't, they're not, um, they're not a year old. They would be a year old in say May when they mm -hmm. hatch out of the gravel. So that, that an element of this is that you, we want the fish to, situate themselves in the river and this was you know hypothetical or theorized by by peter and that is but when you put them out at that time of year if you put them out just before winter comes in they have time to situate themselves they're not competing for food as much throughout the winter that there is one uh, among many still outstanding questions but one big question is are we because we're still losing a lot of fish in the river, um, we don't know if we're losing them after um, their final winter in the river, at the, during winter, so-called winter mortality, mm -hmm. or if we're losing them as they migrate out to sea and they get captured by invasives like pickerel and, and bass. So that's a test that we'd like to do through um, tagging study in a in one you know, tributary, we could do that. So we'd watch them survive the winter and then and go out to sea. We also know, and we've seen this, that they, um, some of our river herring are still migrating out to sea that late in the year. So October timeframe. And one of their last um, major diet items before they go into winter could be river herring. In our situation, they don't. England doesn't have river herring like this, but um, a couple of good meals of young river herring be, just before they go into winter could be all it takes to get them through. And, and we don't fully understand that. Um, Janice has quite a few questions here. Um, I'll just take them okay. in order. What's the unit uh, drainage? And, and I'm not sure, Janice, you're talking unit drainage. Um, or the river size yeah. or, yeah. Well, the river's about 25 miles long 
Um, it goes from, if you're familiar with Route 9, what they call the airline uh, highway here in Maine that goes up to Canada, it parallels Route 1 more or less in this location. So it's um, about 25 miles inland, Poca Moonshine Lake, Crawford Lake, you may be familiar with this. Take a look at a map and you'll see. And now the rivers, we have bigger rivers nearby that are 70 miles you know, long, the Machias. So this is the East Machias, the West Machias, or what people just call the Machias River, is about um, 70 miles long, much bigger watershed, more habitat, more diverse um, habitats. And that that would be, you know, that's high on our list to, to get in and really begin to supplement that with these high quality, high quality fish. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, maybe there's some overlap with these. You can read the chat questions too, but she has a question around why are you catching the smolts as they travel out to sea and is fishing banned in the East Machias while you're doing uh, yes. the stocking? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. The um, fishing for Atlantic salmon <laughs> has been banned for quite a while now um, since the, the time of listing almost in 2000. So uh, no directed fishing for Atlantic salmon. However, there is other fishing taking place and there's some, uh, in some cases, maybe a fair amount of incidental take that's happening. Maybe even a little poaching targeted um, take. So there is some impact from trout angling with worms in particular, but even flies will, uh, of course, hurt a small fish like five inch young Atlantic salmon. Yeah. Um, and the smolt trapping is done so that we can have an idea of how many, what our success is that's headed out to sea. And because we've we've done an adipose clip of the fish for, we didn't do it last uh, couple of years, but we did it for a long enough period that we have a, a handle on the ratio. And it gives us um, an idea of what that survival rate is. Um, see, Steve dropped off. I know he was a fan of the work that you're doing, and we still have quite a few people on the call. If you want to unmute your mic and just ask uh, Dwayne yeah. a, a direct question, that would be great. Yeah, I'd love to, uh, Rui. It's, uh, Dwayne, it's Gary Crago here. Great to uh, hear you again tonight and so impressed with the work you've done. I think we met, oh, God, it was when Peter was still alive, so it's been over That's 10 right. years. Right. Um, so interesting. Today I took a tour up in the Merrimack, I'm sorry, the, the Merrimack River in um, Manchester, New Hampshire, and they were talking about fish runs and they were raving about the number of herring and shad that were coming back. So I asked the question, well, what about Atlantic salmon? And the individual leading the tour said, yes, we've had uh, four uh, counted this year in the Merrimack. And I thought, oh my God, that's just so heartbreaking to hear it's so few, but at least it's still some. And I thought, about the work that you do. And it led me to wonder, you know, given the massive failure that we had um, with the Connecticut River restoration, and I think arguably you'd agree that the Penobscot has been pretty much a failure as well. Um, are there biologists and state officials from Massachusetts and from Connecticut that are also interested in what you're doing? And has anybody talked about maybe um, bringing it down here and starting uh, to relook at this? Because I think, um, you know, this, this idea of raising fish the way you do, you know, the, the little athletes is, is so fundamentally different. And the whole process makes me think there's a real chance to be successful down here. They, they have been watching. And of course, you know, the, the scientific community tends to, to stay in touch and keep, keep abreast. The, the resources to do to do what we're doing are sometimes the biggest hurdle. And in <clears throat> I've been down to, for instance, Connecticut River Salmon Association, it's a pretty sizable organization. And they've been around for a long time, 50 years at least, I think. And um, they've they've been watching this closely in I think that it's going to take the the non-governmental sector to to instigate this. So even on even within Maine, uh, 
the Kennebec, amazing river system, high quality water, and the upper Merrimack as well, and the upper Connecticut, yeah. And yeah. so many other places. But, you know, there is this, this thing called dams, and, and doing this in a place where you've got um, the highest likelihood of success. Uh, there are a lot of rivers without dams currently, all five of these that I've pointed to here in this region, for instance. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's a matter of people having the drive, really, and somebody's got to take it and, and just say, well, you know, the game isn't over on the Connecticut or the game isn't over on the Merrimack. And, and, and you can look at the Tyne and what's happened there. You can look at the East Machias or other places. And if we take out one more dam, you know, this, this could be feasible. And so it's, you know, it's really important that we're sort of, as I say, making the rivers or, you know, fixing the rivers at the same time that we're fixing the fish. So, um, yes, people are watching this very closely. It's been adopted now by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So they're, of course, bridging across all these states. NOAA Fisheries, same thing. Um, State of Maine, DMR, Marine Resources here. Um, and they've got their hands into, of course, rivers like the Saco and, and other rivers that are more impaired by, by dams or pollution. But those upper watersheds are, could be tremendous um, juvenile factories, getting the fish around the dams and up to those, you know, those highly productive waters like on the Kennebec, um, Sandy River. The potential for the Sandy River is um, right off the charts. And however, there's four hydro dams below it. And that's what was taking up a lot of time in the legislature this morning here in Maine. Uh, so, yeah, great. Yeah. Well, thanks, Toy. Yeah. Thank you. Can I offer a question? Yeah, Richard. Hi. Uh, I wonder if it's altogether coincidental <clears throat> that the further north you go, as in the Machias, your results with returning fish are better. And if that could be correlated with the fact that the more southerly rivers that are warmer and have warm flows in them are basically turning into striped bass salmon feeding areas. I know in Hartford, below the power plant in Hartford, there's several hundred stripers hanging around there all year round that weren't there in the colonial times. Mm. Because the water was cold in the colonial times and they didn't have the outflow from the power plant. And when the power were dropping down to Connecticut <clears throat> from that enormous stocking project that was going on 25 years ago, Basically, we wound up with a lot of stripers in the Connecticut and River that were putting a lot of weight on, basically, thanks to the hatcheries upstream. And I have a hunch that in the Merrimack, it's turning into a striped bass feeding program also. And when you think that there's, there's a lot of stripers in the, in the Penobscot, and, but not as many as in more southerly rivers. And I have a hunch that there's less salmon feeding of par into being converted into striped bass in the Penobscot, and your likely successes are to be further and further north where the, striper, the stripers aren't hanging around in the rivers to nail the par when they drop downstream. So I think there's a real quarrel. These rivers aren't what they were in 1750. There's a lot of warm water dropping in there. There's a lot of stripers hanging around that weren't hanging around in those rivers back in 17, 1750. Hmm. And it's, it's heartbreaking to think of all the effort that goes into getting these eight inch fish up to that size where they can drop down and they're just getting, they're being fed into striped bass. I know this happened in the North River down in Marshfield <clears throat> 30 or 40 years ago. The state of Massachusetts had a huge stocking program where they were putting Chinook uh, Pacific salmon, Chinook salmon, in the in the um, North River, which was a fabulous river because it had huge herring runs and all the rest of it. 
And the state finally gave up on it because everyone fishing for stripers off the end of the North River were basically opening up the fish and finding them full of uh, eight inch long Chinook salmon. And um, it, it's a discouraging thing to think that you can get all these eight inch fish that are dropping down and they're probably getting eaten. Not that I have anything against striped bass, but it, it, the rivers aren't what they were in 1750. And I really wonder, you know, due to water temperature and even now with climate change, as the stripers are creeping up, you know, five or 10 miles further north every year with the water being warmer, I'd have a hunch there's going to be plenty of stripers in the Machias probably 50 years from now. And who knows what's going to happen to the salmon dropping down the river in, yeah. in those days. So, so Richard, why don't we let, because uh, yeah. uh, we're going a little bit over here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let Dwayne I, I that ran question. Uh, are you yeah. seeing stripers uh, up there? And is, there is there an impact? There is an impact. And, and that's, yes, the jury is definitely out. We see the, we know what's going on with climate. It's, it's underway. It's, it's uh, rolling forward and that very well could be the case. And, and there are other species at play as well, other than stripers, the very well-known salmon river, the Miramichi and you know, Gary had asked if others were watching what we're doing. The Canadians are watching very closely what we're doing as well, because they're in some river systems having difficulties um, too with salmon programs. Um, there's a tremendous uh, striper population up in in New Brunswick, way way north of where we are, and stripers showing up in places that they've never been seen before, way up into uh, upper, you know, the Quebec and even Labrador, I believe now. So that's it's a reality. Uh, I think cormorants, other things that have recovered, seals, people have often. Um, pointed at that. That that is all true. And I think that the you know the question around what can we do to mitigate that? Well, I, on the Miramichi, they've given uh, the tribes their permission to go in and harvest commercially striped bass. And in fact they're being sold in Boston to my uh, uh, my knowledge. So maybe there's a way to to make uh, lemonade out of lemons and that kind of thing. So uh, they eat seals in places, and uh, I'm not saying <laughs> do it here, but uh, you go to Labrador and they're eating seals. So, um, yes, the and the, the the invasives in the rivers systems themselves, and this is why the East Machai has been a good place to test this because it's it's a system that has bass and pickerel, smallmouths as well as largemouths, and yet despite that, we're seeing really good results in comparison to other places that have you know less of a, a burden of like that. So um, we've got to continue to try and and part of this too is the we've got to overwhelm the predators with other fish. Really robust river herring populations, really robust smelt populations mm -hmm. where we can rebuild those and and here we're we're actually seeing you know, the smelt populations rebound. So because of some of the dam removals and things like that. So you got to give them something else to eat, but we can eat them, right? Um, and that's what they're doing in places like Norway. Um, they'll go in and take bass out in a commercial, not bass in that case, but um, other so-called coarse fish, right? And and sell them. There's more Very than one way to do this, right? Yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of challenges and a lot of uh, solutions out there. And it just like you said, Dwayne takes the uh, the energy to uh, go after all these solutions and put them in place. So I I, I think I want to respect everyone's time because we're supposed to go to eight, and it's a little bit after. Really fantastic presentation, and I appreciate everyone being here. Uh, Jeff, do you want to close with any comments? Just want to say thank you to Dwayne for sharing that with us. And uh, we've been anticipating this uh, presentation and information from you for, for a number of months now. And uh, um, just uh, your uh, story is inspiring. 
And um, so we look forward to a continuing relationship with you. And maybe some of us can make a field trip up to uh, your end of the world in, in the fall. Yes, please do. Yeah. Please do. I think I should... know, the COVID is starting to allow for a little more of that. And... Yeah. Can, can the public visit the hatchery? Yes, we, we encourage it. We put an open sign out front when, you know, pre-COVID days, encouraging people to come in through and see what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, the uh, TU National meeting is going to be held in Portland, Maine this July. Have you been invited to speak? I have not. And um, that would be worth, I'd be interested in that. Definitely. Let me see. Um, Gary, you may have better connections than I do, but let's see if the agenda isn't fully set yet. I, th I think the TU community that shows up there would be really interested in this and another way of sharing a methodology that's better than the traditional methodology. So um, we'll, we'll, between some of us, we'll try and connect you. Gary? Sure. Um, hang on a second, Amy. Um, you know, one of the problems, Rui, and I think anybody who's been involved in TU can, for a long time, can speak to this, and Duane knows it only too well. You know, the when most people hear the word hatchery, it immediately raises flags because it's the traditional type of hatchery where you get very poor quality fish. They're actually detrimental to most systems. So I worry that it's going to be difficult even though Wayne is Dwayne is doing something completely different and we've been very supportive of it when you say to the folks uh, at TU National oh, we'd want a presentation about someone who's doing an Atlantic salmon restoration through a hatchery up there um, you don't have to eat it all it's going to require some uh, conversation to make sure that there's no uh, negative response to that but I, I think it'd be a great thing to do and Unfortunately, I'm going to be in Montana, well, not so unfortunately this year, but so I won't attend the meeting, but I think it's a great idea, Dwayne, and I hope we could get you in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks, Gary. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, well, thank you. Appreciate so um, I hope everyone has a great rest of the week, and uh, Dwayne, thank you very, very much, and Jeff for organizing this and getting Dwayne as a guest speaker, and we hope to do continued support for DSF and um for the rest of you, we will see you uh, next month when uh, Jay, thank you. our next chapter meeting. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Well done. Thanks, thank you very much. Thanks, Dwayne. Thank you. Night. Good night, Good night, everyone. Have a great week.